关一下吧，谢谢。Hello， 大家，我们马上开始了，三、二、一。Good afternoon, Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to EU China Population Business Co. Collaboration Webinar. We will give the audience a, a few seconds to log in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to EU-China Population Business Collaboration Webinar. We will give the audience a few seconds to log in. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to EU-China Population Business Collaboration Webinar. We will give the audience a few seconds to log in. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Welcome to EU-China Population Business Collaboration Webinar. This webinar is co-organized by EU SME Center and the China Britain Business Council. First of all, allow me to introduce EU SME Center. EU SME Center has members including China Italy Chamber of Commerce, China Britain Business Council, Danish Chamber of Commerce in China, Euro, Euro Chambers, and the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. As you can see from this slide, the EU SME Center is an EU Commission funded project which since two, uh, 2010 helps European small and medium sized enterprise get ready to do business and grow in China. Currently in its third phase, the project is scheduled to run from October 2020 to March 2022. The EU SME Center is an official member of the Enterprise Europe Network and is partnered with over 270 government agencies and business support uh, organizations in Europe and China. As for services, EU SME Center acts several rules, including Knowledge Center, Advice Center, Training Center, and the SME Advocacy Platform. There are several webinars and activities are approaching. In September, we have events in biopharma sector, organic food and beverage market in China, and also events about business environment and the market, market entry and the funding for European startups. Two, more, uh, two new reports about e-commerce and healthcare are coming soon, and five other new reports in progress. At the same time, we have EU China gaming and esports matchmaking happening on 24th September at Shanghai and online. And the European SME Pavilion on China International Industry Fair from the 1st of December to 5th of, uh, of December at Shanghai. Before we start our webinar, we would like to kindly remind you to use the Q&A button if you have any questions at any time during the event. And also the translation function below your screen. Uh, you can use the uh, translation function there. Here is the agenda for our event today. Our first speaker will be James Bryan, president of International Business of Beijing Open Book. He will share the overview of the Chinese publishing market and the children publishing domain. Since Mr. Bryan cannot attend our webinar through pre-recording uh, video due to the time difference, Ms. Yanping Jia, the vice president of Beijing Open Book, will be here for answering your questions. After, we have Lucy Song from CBBC, who will share the policy updates in China's publishing sector. And finally, we, have, we will have Mr. Cao Wenxuan, the best-selling and award-winning uh, author of uh, children's uh, literature to share his insights on Chinese readers. First, let's welcome 
James Bryant, the president of international business from Beijing Open Book. Mr. Bryant has uh, abundant experience in digital publishing, and he is also the founder and CEO of Jiang Boyin LLC. In 2017, Beijing Open Book established an international strategic partnership with Jiang Boyin LLC. Let's start this video. Good afternoon, I'm Jim Bryant, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all from CBBC this afternoon. For the next 15 minutes or so, I'll be providing you with an overview of the Chinese publishing industry. First, for those of you who aren't familiar with OpenBook, please allow me to introduce you. OpenBook is China's leading market research firm focused exclusively on the book publishing industry. OpenBook is privately owned and celebrating its 23rd anniversary this year. We monitor the sales of books for more than 13,000 physical and online bookstores. We've created a cloud-based platform which allows publishers, authors, investors, and others to access the information that we are gathering. Open Book's bestseller charts are regarded as China's most authoritative list. And over the past several years, we've been working closely with a handful of Western publishers and booksellers to identify partnership and investment opportunities in China and throughout Asia. In my view, China is in the midst of its own cultural renaissance. This is highlighted by the familiar new skylines emerging all around China, and also with the impressive high-speed rail systems connecting all of the major cities and the impressive new transportation uh, networks, including new air terminals. But beyond the infrastructure accomplishments, there has been an amazing advancement in the sciences and the arts. And this is also being seen in the book publishing industry today. Let's not forget that China invented paper and ink over 2,000 years ago, and also invented woodblock printing. During the Tang Dynasty, 1618 to 907 AD, China was the world's leader in book production. And today, the quality of the books that are being published in China is reflected in the international awards that Chinese authors have received, such as Mo Yan, who won the Nobel Prize, and Professor Cao Wenchuan, who recently won the coveted Hans Christian Andersen Award. And following my presentation, you'll have the opportunity to meet Professor Cao. And that brings us here today, where China is once again surely the global leader in the number of books it prints and publishes for domestic and global consumption. Let's take a quick look at the overall print book market in China in 2020, which was greatly affected by the coronavirus. In 2020, China's book retail market shows negative growth for the first time. Last year, OpenBook tracked over 97 billion RMB in sales, or approximately uh, 10.83 billion British pounds, or 12.6 billion euros. Growth chart charts showed a negative 5.08 downturn in 2020. Between 2015 and 2019, the Chinese retail market had been growing at more than 10% annually, making the 2020 retreat um, especially sharp. Much of the recent growth is attributed to the positive growth in online sales. Online retail channels saw a jump of 7.27% in book sales, amounting to 76.7 billion RMB or 8.8 .8 billion pounds. Meanwhile, physical bookstores experienced a plunge of negative 33.8%, amounting to 2.34 billion pounds. Please note that the online stores include names that you're probably familiar with, like JD.com, Tmall, Dangdang, and a large number of independent online booksellers. Over 170,000 new titles were introduced in 2020. This is down 11.85% compared to 2019. The annual number of new titles in the retail market has been pretty stable since 2012. When China first entered the WTO in, in 2000, its new market economy and the publishing industry was focused on quantity of books to meet unsatisfied demand. Today, the Chinese government and publishers are focused more on quality than on quantity. So what are the best-selling categories in the children's book market? If you take a look at the pie chart here, um, you can see the dominant position rep represented by children's books itself. Children's books and school study books saw positive growth as well. 
In fact, if you combine all of the other leading categories, including social sciences, study aids, science and technology and languages, you can see that the Chinese book industry is firmly rooted in learning. The children's segment is the largest market segment in China's book market, accounting for 28.3% market share in terms of revenue. I'm pleased to share with you more data on this important segment. In 2020, we found that the children's book market accounted for over one fourth of the total book market with pretty steady growth rate. Next, we'll go on and look at the sub-segments in the children's, uh, the children's book market. This is a really interesting chart, and you can see that, that over uh, a period of the last 10 years or so, the dominance of literature for children has, has steadily declined, while we've seen rapid growth in uh, cartoon comic illustration books. And also, just this past year, we've seen a pretty dramatic increase in the number of encyclopedias uh, or compilations of facts. That are, that are being presented and uh, being sold very well, including a couple of books from the UK, which we'll, we'll highlight later. Now, let's take a quick look at the overall book market in the first half of 2021, and let's take a closer look at the market's recovery from COVID-19. As you know, China was able to contain COVID very early on, and businesses largely returned to normal over a year ago. But there were some interesting new developments, which may be a precursor for these trends to emerge as well in other global markets as they too recover from COVID. In the first half of 2021, the overall book retail market showed a positive year-on-year -year growth uh, rate of 11.45%. The physical store channel actually has shown substantial forward momentum with an increase of 51.83% year-on-year. The overall online store channel continued to maintain positive growth, but as you can see, the growth rate has slowed down significantly with a year over year growth rate of only 3.06%. Strong discounts and convenient shopping are the major draws for online retail. But in 2021, the leisure reading market has not returned to the pre-epidemic level. And this is being seen as, as being behind some of the deterioration of the online sales channel. In the first half of 2021, the children's market was still the largest market, but the size fell. Social science market ranked second and accounted for a significant increase. The gap between the top two segments has narrowed down though. So here are some key market trends for the first half of 2021. The growth of online store channels has slowed down significantly, while physical stores have not yet fully recovered. In the post-epidemic era, the consumption habits of readers have changed, and more people have turned to online store channels, making the recovery of physical bookstores even more difficult. We've also witnessed the dramatic emergence of short video e-commerce. I'm sure you all are familiar with, with uh, TikTok and uh, other channels right now that are, that are very actively promoting uh, uh, promoting uh, books. And the most popular books that are pur being purchased right now through uh, sites such as TikTok um, are children's books, not surprisingly, followed by self-help and, uh, and, and life. And one important thing to highlight here is that, that the online sales channels typically sell books at 60% off um, their, their price and children's books can also reach as much as 67% off their, their list price. Next, let's get to something important to you, I'm sure, and we can look at the sales performance of imported books in China, especially books written by British and EU authors. First, let's take a, a close look at, at uh, uh, the impact that all foreign authors have in China today. As you can see, 22% of the books offered for sale in China today are from foreign authors. These represent 27% of um, overall sales and 26% of the total units sold in China. And an interesting thing to look at here is, is the continued uh, growth uh, year over year in, in uh, foreign books. Let's take a close look to see how imported titles were divided amongst foreign publishers in 2020. 
As you can see, British authors account for the top two with 16.76%. And we can also see that uh, French, German, and Italian authors occupy the top 10. Among the books written by British authors, Children's represents 34.8% by ISBNs and over 55% by units sold. Among books written by EU authors, children's books represent 44.05% by ISBNs and 67% by units sold. When we look at the top 20, uh, top 30 rather, children's bestsellers by British authors in 2020, we can see authors such as Anthony Brown and Benji Davis had a pretty good year. Here's a continuation of that list. And here we highlight the top five children's bestsellers by British authors. And here we're sharing the, the top 30 bestselling uh, bestsellers from EU authors. And you can see the uh, remarkable position that uh, Christiane Joybois and Christiane Henrique have uh, in occupying uh, an, practically an unprecedented uh, number of uh, positions in the top 30. But also notice the price of the book. This is 10 RMB or about uh, a little less, a little more than one pound. And here's a continuation of, of that list. And here's a highlight of the top five from the EU. So I imagine that all of you are wondering, what is the best way to partner with Chinese publishers, booksellers, and authors? What is the best way for you to get a piece of this gigantic pie? And what is the best way for you to sell your rights to Chinese publishers? I have several suggestions. We strongly recommend working with a local partner. This is largely due to language and culture. Nearly all discussions with editors are conducted in Chinese, and the process is largely shaped by China's unique cultural values. There are many fine agencies to choose to work from in China, and most of you, I assume, are already working with one of these. As a big data company, OpenBook can, of course, recommend that you take a data-driven approach to identifying, engaging, and following up with the publishers that you select to work with. And if you need help getting in touch with an agent, um, we are happy to talk to you about that. Here's our database system for publishers. It's in Chinese. You can check the sales of your books in China by every day logging into the system. We can also provide the English report based on your needs. If you would like to check the sales for some books, some categories, publishers, or the whole market, and here's an example of a report that we can submit to you. These include the total size of the market, the best-selling titles, or perhaps we can even help you track your titles in the market in translation. Every business day, over 10,000 Chinese editors will log into our system to review our data. We are currently testing a new system to promote foreign rights to Chinese editors. We can also promote your rights to Chinese publishers and your books to Chinese bookstores through our customer network and through our publishing industry conferences. Through simple steps, we could connect your stories to the opportunities in translation, print, and other rights. You'll get regular feedback on your rights for sale. Our upstream customers today include over 300 publishers in China. And our downstream customers, bookstores, um, include more than 13,000 uh, bookstores. 
We are actively involved in assisting Western publishers, booksellers, and investors to develop strategies for entering or expanding their presence in China. We'd be happy to talk with you about what your goals are. We recently advised a leading British and Israeli augmented reality technology company identify market entry strategies for China. We also introduced them to China's best-selling children's books, which they have incorporated into their platform. And we introduced them to a Chinese bookseller to help them distribute their innovative AR platform in China. We also recently advised a leading European audiobook uh, seller um, to acquire the best-selling Chinese author's copyrights for global distribution outside of China, initially in Chinese. And they're currently in the process of recording these titles in Chinese. The project will last at least five years and involve Chinese authors and promotional events outside of China. Open Book organizes a variety of events every year to facilitate communication between members of the book publishing industry. These events give everybody the opportunity to get together to show the latest developments and to discuss important trends. And finally, let's consider cooperating with some Chinese best-selling authors. As I mentioned earlier, China is now focused on quality and an increasingly, increasing number of these quality titles are being produced by Chinese authors. As publishers and agents, you have been successful in selling books into China. We now see an opportunity for you to use your skills to sell the best books from China through your network. Let me present some Chinese best-selling authors. Yang Hongying is China's best-selling uh, children's author in modern history. She sold more than 180 million books in the past 14 years. She's been compared to America's Mr. Rogers with her remarkable ability to communicate with children and to help them understand the feelings they experience during life's transitions. Shen Shishi is another best-selling children's author in China. He is known as the king of animal stories. He's written over 40 titles about animal stories for children. To date, he has sold more than 67 million copies and his best-selling title, Dream of Being a Wolf King, alone has sold more than 20 million copies. Dr. Li Miao is also another very popular children's author. Uh, Dr. Li's works have made it easy for everyone to understand complex science topics. One of his current best-selling books for children is called Quantum Mechanics for Kids. Then we have Chen Li as a nonfiction writer. His most famous series called 30 Minutes in Cartoon has been listed in Open Book's nonfiction bestseller chart top 30 since the publication of each individual title. He uses his humorous language and funny comic style to present history, economics, and cultural stories. He's recently made the unbelievable achievement of capturing 10 of the top 30 positions on Open Book's nonfiction list. Finally, the writer, Professor Kao Wen Chuen, who you'll hear from shortly, it's universally recognized in China. He is, of course, the recent recipient of the 2016 Hans Christian Andersen Award. His novel, Bronze and Sunflower, which was translated into English by Helen Wang, has been listed on the New York Times bestseller list. To date, his books have sold more than 62 million copies in China. China is continuing to continuously deal with the ep epidemic, and we are very optimistic about the future of the Chinese publishing industry. Although during this special outbreak period, you may not be able to come to China, our enthusiasm for welcoming you personally in the future has not been diminished. And we are very pleased to help your business in China as well. We share CBBC's core goal of building a bridge between China and Britain and the EU with fact-based information and analytics. We are happy to help you identify strategic opportunities and partners in the world's fastest growing publishing marketplace. Thank you all once again. It was a pleasure to speak to you and your colleagues at CBBC. We wish you all much success. Welcome to China. Many thanks to Mr. Brian's sharing. If you have any questions, you could leave them in our Q&A box. We will give you the answers during our Q&A session. Next, let's welcome Lucy Song from CDBC. Lucy joined CDBC as IP Pro Protect Manager in 2018. 
and provides support and advice to British business on IP protection in China. She has a rich experience in IP protection, helping rights owners fight against IP infringements in various industries. Her specialist covered IP queries, online IP protection, offline enforcement, as well as supporting IP dialogue between UK and China. Let's pass our speaker to Lucy. So I'm delighted to join today's webinar to introduce about CVC's IP services, as well as our corporate protection work in China. So first of all, I would like to give a brief introduction of our IP work. CVC's business environment and IP team provides with UK rights owners with a wide range of support services and programs designed to support British partners with protecting their IP in China. CBC works with a wide range of British and Chinese stakeholders across government and businesses to help improve the environment for online protection, offline enforcement, cross-border protection, as well as IP legislation and policy analysis. Our aim is to facilitate cooperation between UK and China to develop a business environment underpinned by legal and regulatory certainty and transparency to help support dynamic and sustainable businesses. We have also established long-term partnership with key stakeholders in China, including academic institutions, think tanks, associations, such as International Publishers Copyright Protection Coalition in China, IPCC. Our focused area are IP protection, IP enforcement, and IP utilization. For IP protection, we update and interpret it of IP legislations, policies, and case studies in China. We also call for comments on major legislation and policies, and submission of position papers on key amendment of IP legislations, such as the amendment of corporate law. We also advocate and engage with key UK and Chinese stakeholders on specific IP issues of concern to our members. We also conduct research on hotspot IP issues, such as malicious trademark registration in China, trademark hundering, copyright protection in the digital environment, etc. For IP enforcement, we conduct online enforcement through strategic partnership with leading e-commerce and social media platforms, such as Alibaba, ByteDance Douyin, Tencent Weixin, JD.com, Pinduoduo, Xiaohongshu, DHgate and Weidian, etc. For offline enforcement, um, through cooperation with online platforms, rights holders, and law enforcement authorities, we support rights owners to conduct offline enforcement. For cross-border enforcement, we have conducted, uh, we have cooperated with major Chinese customs, such as GACC, uh, Shanghai Customs, Guangzhou Customs, and Shenzhen Customs to support rights owners, as well as copyright owners, to protect their copyright at cross borders. For IP utilization, we have conducted IP licensing and IP-backed financing with rights holders. For this page, I would like to introduce about our IPR protection accelerator. We facilitate IPR protection of businesses by getting fast track to e-commerce and social medias IPR protection measures and direct access to IPR protection programs that authorities and industrial associations based on our long-standing partnership and successful IP programs with our major Chinese stakeholders. We have signed an MOU with Alibaba, JD.com, Tencent Weixin to support uh, rights owners and as well as copyright owners to protect their IP in the Chinese on e-commerce platforms. We also held IP roundtables with ByteDance Douyin, Pinduoduo, uh, and Xiaohongshu to let uh, brand owners to have better understanding about how to protect their copyright as well as trademark on those e-commerce platforms. Uh, we have also built, developed many um, IP programs with those platforms to uh, let rights owners to better use 
uh, the platform's IP protection measures to safeguard their IP on the platforms. For instance, we have developed the brand protection program, as well as the infringement complaint e-system, the copyright protection mechanism, as well as the proactive monitoring system, the offline investigation mechanism with Tencent Weixing to support copyright owners to safeguard their IP rights on the platform, as well as to enforce against pirate books. For this part, I would like to introduce about relevant laws and regulations regarding copyright protection in China. The first of all, I would like to introduce about DMCA. DMCA is a copyright law of the United States, which enables copyright owners to request to have removed from a website infringing content posed by other users. Um, and a takedown notice that complies with the DMCA includes substantially the following information, which includes a physical or electronic signature of the person authorized to act on behalf of the owner of the copyright that is alleged infringed, the identification of the copyright work claimed to have been infringed, identification of the material that it is claimed to be infringing, the complaining party's contact information, a statement that the complaining party has a good faith that a user using the material in the manner of complaint of is not authorized by the copyright owner, its agent or the law, a statement that the information in the notification is accurate and under penalty of a jury that the complaining party is authorized to act on behalf of the owner of an exclusive right that is alleged infringed. And according to the Chinese Civil Code, it also stipulates uh, how rights owners, how corporate owners can protect their IP online. It stipulates about uh, the notice and takedown mechanism. So when the internet users conduct IP, uh, conduct IP infringement online, the IPR rights holder should be entitled to notify internet service provider to take necessary measures such as deleting, blocking, and disconnecting links. Such notice should contain the preliminary evidence of infringement and rights holders and data information. The internet service provider, upon receiving such notice, should transmit the notice to relevant internet users and should take necessary measures according to preliminary evidence and types of services. And if they fail to do so, it should be they should be joint liable for additional damages along with the users on the platform. And also, according to the Article 42 of e-commerce law, it also stipulates uh, the notice and takedown mechanism that supports copyright owners to enforce their IP on the e-commerce platforms. So where the intellectual property rights holders consider their IP have been infringed upon, they should be entitled to notify an e-commerce platform operator to take necessary measures such as deleting, blocking, and disconnecting, disconnecting links or ending transactions or services. Such notice should contain the preliminary evidence of infringement. The e-commerce platform operator, upon receiving such notice, should take necessary measures in a timely manner and transmit notice to the operators on the platform. So if you have discovered pirate books online on Chinese e-commerce platforms, you can send notice to the platform and the, and the platform should take necessary measures to remove those uh, infringing content. For well, the next part, I would like to give you some practical suggestions to see if you have encountered some parrot books online. First of all, I would like to introduce about how to protect your copyright on Alibaba. So the first step, we would suggest you to search the keyword of your books on Alibaba website to see if there are any parrot books. So once you have found parrot books on Alibaba platform, then there are several ways to submit notices of copyright infringement to Alibaba. The best way is to register an account on IPP platform and provide an, an, the indicated information required for Alibaba to process your takedown notices. On our IP platform, you can also manage and track all your notices via account. Alternatively, you may also file takedown notices via Alibaba's online protection system or email at iprart on alibabain.com. So after you have su successfully registered account on Alibaba IP protection platform, 
you will see this page and they will re require you to submit IPR information. Uh, you need to uh, select the type of your work, such as the, uh, the, you can choose the book and you need to provide with the name of your submitted book to provide with the ISBN as well as the also copyright holder of your submitted book. Then you can upload uh, your IPR to Alibaba platform. Once approved by Alibaba, then you can enter this page. You can su submit a complaint. You can choose the complaint website, such as Taobao, Timo, Timo Global, 1688, Alibaba.com, AliExpress, and, and Lazada. They all belong to Alibaba Group. And the next page is that if you choose Taobao, you can choose the copyright, um, the IPR tab as copyright, and choose the reason code as piracy. Then you need to prove provide with the proof type, such as the um, test purchase verification that you purchased this book and identified it is a pirate book. And also Alibaba check to evidence uh, as well as judicial or administrative decision or online evidence collection. And once you have filled this form, you can upload it to Alibaba and Alibaba will process your IP complaints accordingly. For the next page, I would like to introduce about how to protect your copyright on Tencent Weixing. Because we have received many requests from international publishers that they have discovered pirated ebooks on Tencent Weixing's official account. As you can see that um, this official account, they provide ebooks of Cambridge International AS and A-level computing course book, which infringe their copyright. And if you have discovered this kind of copyright infringement online, then you can uh, use your wishing um, to scan below QR code to file a complaint against, the copyright, against copyright infringement on the platform. And the wishing legal team will process your complaint accordingly. So that's the brief introduction about how to protect your copyright on major Chinese e-commerce and social media platforms. So if you have any detailed information or questions you would like to ask, ask, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucy. Now we are going to hear from Mr. Cao Wenxuan, who is the best-selling author of children's literature. Mr. Cao Wenxuan is a best-selling author of children's literature and the 2016 Hans Christian Anderson Author Award winner. Mr. Cao is also a professor of Chinese at Beijing University, associate director of the Children's Literature Committee of the Chinese Writers Association. As one of the most influential children's literature writers in China, Mr. Cao has written over 60 books more than 40 of which have received awards and uh, recognitions. He twice won the China General Administration of Prize and the Publication of Standing Books Award for export titles. Most popular titles such as The Grass House and the Browns and the Sunflower have collect uh, collectively sold millions of copies in China. Now let's welcome Mr. Cao Wenxuan. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to meet with all of you through the internet. Isn't this a wonderful way to meet each other virtually? I have more than 100 works translated into other languages and published in several countries. About a hundred of my works are being published. They are available in major European languages, English, French, German, Russian, Italian, Spanish, Greek, and Swedish, available in all major European languages. According to a statistics, according to a statistics, Professor Cao, please continue. His slide is not moving. 
我们现在很热衷于。Yeah, let's continue. Yeah. 现在可以听得到、嗯。呃，我们现在很热衷于谈论呃什么样 ？When we are enthusiastic of talking about what kind of work can be cross-cultural, I wonder if my works have really crossed into other cultures. But I'm humble enough to know that even though I have crossed into other cultures, it will take me a long time for my works to go deeper into other cultures. Not just me, all Chinese writers whose works have ventured abroad would go through this going deeper process. And how to reach deeper into other cultures? We need to work harder, write better works. We also have to wait, wait. We have to wait until people of other cultures become formally more familiar with Chinese culture, Chinese literature. We know that the storehouse has been printed for more than 500 times. It's very popular in China. Printed for more than 500 times in China. Each time it prints about several dozen thousand. And Bronze and Sunflower has been published, has been printed for more than 300 times in China. As for when my works will be as popular as these two in other parts of the world, as in China, all of us have to wait. I see myself as a fortunate Chinese writer. So let me share with you why I think my works have traveled to Paris, London, Berlin, Rome, Moscow, Madrid, and other European places. My first point is, there's no other thing that can help your work cross time and space, but literariness. When you're right, a literary work, it must be an art. For all my works, no matter how different they read, they are built on a fundamental I have grasped. Sure, literature change? Yes, of course. But any change will be built on that fundamental. Anything that has a name has its basic characters. Only when we accept these characters can we talk about change. Let me illustrate this concept with an everyday item, say a chair. What is a chair? What is the basic nature of a chair? My definition is a chair is a chair because you can sit on it. This is the chairness. If a thing cannot be seated, it is not a chair. In fact, chairs are changing. Now, who knows how many chairs there are in this world? Four legged, three, two, one, or no legged chairs. And chairs are made of a variety of materials and have many styles at home and abroad, old and new. But the chairness will not be changed. A chair will not become a sword. A sword cannot be seated. If you don't believe me, try to sit on a sword. Therefore, if it is a piece of literature, it must have literariness. And based on this core belief, you can change. After writing Bronze and Sunflower and the Straw House, I began to write a fantasy novel called Da Wang Tong. This novel with many volumes is different from my previous ones. I used to write countryside, water towns, family courtyards with a gentle and relaxed tone. 
But in Taiwan Tong, are magnificent sceneries, deserts, high in the sky and low on the ground, with dramatic plots and romantic narratives. But in terms of pursuit for aesthetics, sympathy for human nature, focusing on scenery and details, I believe they are essentially mine. They're just different writings on the same aesthetic platform. Whenever I write any piece of work, I always try to beat myself. After I won the Hans Andersen Awards, all my works after that have been changing and revolutionizing myself. Now all my works have traveled out of Yomadi, a field. I wrote a work out of the oil rice field. I don't think my work is non-mainstream. It is not popular. My writing is always based on my understanding of literature. I'm confident that I have a firm grasp of Chinese literature history. I have a deep understanding of classic works. I still stick to the literariness, the fundamental of literature. And this is the truth of literature. It states as day one. I don't brag this as a literary ideal. I just follow the basics about literature. Literature is different from other things because you cannot discuss literature in the framework of evolutionism. Yesterday's works are never worse than today's, and works in the future will not necessarily be better than today's. The standards of good literature are always there in the Book of Songs, the Book of Chu, poetry and verse of the Han, Tang, Song, and Yuan dynasties. They are enshrined in a dream of red mansions. In the works of Dante, Shakespeare, Tolstoy, Chekhov, in all their works. But if you put literature in a framework of evolutionism, then why not an English writer today cannot necessarily be that of Shakespeare? Shakespeare lived in a long time ago, but now, living in today's world, so many years after Shakespeare, why you cannot write much better than Shakespeare? If you can't write better than Shakespeare, why you are still writing? Maybe you should end up doing physical labor, stripping the floor, ascending careers. But the history of literature does not support this. It's not one peak dwarfing the other. It is a lot of peaks standing high in their wrong space and time. While the world is much governed by the theory of evolution, literature is an exception. And that's why literature is a wonderful form of art. Classic works are still classic. And we have seen the yesterday of literature is linked to today's literature. They are inseparable. If they are separated, the lower stream will suffer from drought. Famine will come. Do you feel that famine will come if the lower stream is out of water? I believe literature has a firm foundation and a boundary, just like there's always a boundary for power and a boundary for a country. Wars in human history are more or less related to boundary disputes. A sacred job in ancient Rome is to measure land and define the boundary. The land surveyor in France Kafka's castle is measuring the boundary of the castle and village. The land surveyor is a symbolic role. 
just like adults' literature, children's literature must be based on its literariness. That's the eternal nature. I will forever remind myself that I should always be clear of the boundary of literature. Only when we safeguard the boundary of literature can we embrace the future. And this is the eternal truth. I'm so confident of my view of literariness. That's because my work always support my belief. They stand behind me. For so many years, they have been printed and reprinted, translated and translated into Europe, Latin America, Africa, Oceania, and many countries in Asia. And I understand clearly the reason they can travel far and wide is because I have upheld the boundary and fundamental of literature, just like literature for adults. Children's literature is literature based on literariness. A view I hold high is literature has nothing to do with genre. This is my first point. My second point is, as a novelist, I advise you to write beautiful stories from an unusual or even old angle and with solid plots. I've been always thinking, what kind of novel is a good novel? My standard is works that can stand the test of translation are good works. But what kind of works can stand the test of translation? Of course, novels that tell high quality stories. In the past, we attached great importance to language. All my Chinese friends know that I pay every attention to language. I said every sentence counts, but I don't think language is the only important thing especially for novels. We have exaggerated the role of language. Yes, I pay attention to language, but it's only within Chinese. If my work is translated into English, French, German, Italian, or Japanese, can all the beauty in Chinese language, the rhymes, rhythms, the brief sentences, and all the tunes can be translated and transferred into another language, it will be very difficult. The translator can only try his or her best to transfer the language. No matter how great you are, what mastery you have towards language, you can only try your utmost to approximate the beauty of language. If a translator get recognized by the readers, the readers are recognizing the translation ability of the translator. When Tolstoy's work is translated into Chinese, we have lost his beautiful use of the Russian language. But after reading his great work, like Peace of War and Carolina, we're still deeply touched by his greatness. He is a great literary giant. He is a literary peak high in the sky. Whether translated into Chinese or not, Tolstoy is still a literary giant, regardless of minor loss in translation. But this loss in translation will not diminish a great writer. But after translation, why Tolstoy is still a great writer? Because the story is there, the castle is there, the four families are there, the magnificent Russian stories are there. The beautiful story will not be lost because of translation from Russian to Chinese. I remember one detail. When Natasha participated in a social event 
for the first time, she was very excited. In a hurry to prepare her dress, she had to ask her maids to convert her mother's dress. <coughs> When the maids were doing the alteration, her father came. She forgot what the maids kneeling on the floor were doing and ran to her dad to kiss him. The fresh stitches broke up. This detail, or this fact, remain impressive as ever, no matter how it's translated. So let's remember this basic concept. Fact like a boy sat cross-legged on a tombstone can be cannot be altered, no matter how what languages it is translated into. So we must tell a good story, and everything depends on it. Characters and deep stories, everything you want to strive at, will not be realized without a high quality story. But I have to admit that poetry is a different case. Sometimes poetry cannot be translated. Once poetry is translated. Its rhymes and rhythms will be lost. Translation of poetry could be a compromise. The world is constantly moving, and stories are created. Stories have existed before human writing. Creating story is the innate human nature. So is listening to story. It's the yearning of human being to listen to story. Stories have been told in very ancient times, from the Neolithic to the Paleolithic. The shape of a Neanderthal's skull suggests he was listening to a story, according to archaeologists. The storytelling tomb figure. From China, such as how engaged his audience were. You can imagine how engaged his audience were. In Arabian Nights, witty and brave Shahrazad used the charm of her story to save women from the tyrant's knife. The desire to listen to stories inspires the storyteller to tell more engaging stories. This prompts storytellers to compete with one another, so stories move one step closer to novels and children's fairy tale. Even when we can tell the difference between novels and stories, we have to admit that stories preclude novels. And a novel hinges on a story. Stories are the supreme element in the complex mechanism of a novel. British critic Foster E. M. said he hopes the supreme element is not story, but something else. It could be beautiful tunes, dawning of truths. But I don't agree. Novels need to treat storytelling. As it's fundamental, as novels meant to tell stories. This is the nature of novels. The third point I would like to talk about is: despite different cultures, we share the same human nature. People in this world share the same human nature, no matter the color of your skin is white, yellow, or black, no matter which culture you come from. We all share the same human nature. If a writer wants his or her work to go global and transcultural, what he or she can do is.
Professor Tao, please. What we can do is to write stories that can touch the basic human nature. Only can we touch the basic human nature can his or her work travel far and wide. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tao. So if there's no question in our q and box, then your feedback is always very important to us. Please scan the QR code on the screen to share your feedback. You can also click the questionnaire link in the invitation email. Thank you all today for participating in our event. We hope this webinar is helpful for your business. If you have any further questions, feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you and wish you have a nice day and afternoon. Mm-hmm.